Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wrist Watch Revival. My name is Marshall. Thank you so much for coming along. This time on the bench, check out this little dress watch we've got. This is a Universal Genève, which is a company you may have heard of. They used to make a whole bunch of watches. They went out of business and I think somebody bought them now, but they, uh, but back in the day, they made a lot of watches. This one dates to probably the late forties, maybe early fifties. It's a dress watch as you can see. And uh, what's not to like, right? A beautiful little thin gold dress watch to wear on special occasions, pretty sweet. Um, this one I got off of eBay. It was advertised as not much. Um, I could tell that the crystal was broken. I think it said that the that it was running, so that's probably a good thing. But um, now we'll have to see how well it's actually running. And um, yeah, I thought it would be a nice little project to bring back to life for you here on the channel. So that's what we're gonna do this time around. The thing that really caught my eye, by the way, was this, check this out. You see that discoloration, that brown versus the gold? That's where the gold plating is completely worn off and that is in fact brass underneath it. That's what happens to brass when it's exposed to the element. So we are gonna need to take care of that at some point. Also take a look here, do you see that groove in the side of the case? If you ever see that, that means that it's a snap on case back, meaning that it's just held on by friction, you don't screw it down. And you use a case knife just like this, you press it in, and then give it a little twist and that will free up the case back. That's all you need to do for that type of case back. But you do need to find that little groove. There's always one there. If there isn't one, it's probably a screw down case back. Ooh, take a look at this movement. Very nice. Pretty movement here from Universal Genève. They made this one in, uh, in Switzerland as many of these watches were made. And also, if you've watched a lot of my channel, you may have noticed something that will give us a little bit of a hint as to the age of this movement. If you haven't watched my channel that much, I'm just gonna tell you. <laughs> so if you look at the swinging balance wheel there, take a look at the top of it where there's that big ruby jewel. As you can see, there's no shock protection system on it. There's normally some thin brass springs that are on top, and that means that if you drop your watch, there's a shock to the system, if you will it won't necessarily break that part. And this was something that it is actually invented a long time before, but it didn't really become commonplace on these watches until say late 50s, early 60s, at, wh at which point it became the only way to do things. And uh, they never really looked back. As you can see, I can take off the front bezel and pop out the movement. The movement and the dial are stuck together and we've got this case which looks a little dirty. And as I mentioned before, we're gonna to have to address that gold plating situation as well. In the meantime though, I can continue with my disassembly here. The first thing that we'll wanna do is get the hands off. So what I'm gonna do is put the crown back in. Why? Well, really simple. I just wanna line up the hands so that they're easier to get off with these hand levers because if they're pointing in different directions, it can be a little bit difficult to get a good angle. As you can see, I also use a plastic bag, and that's just to protect the dial itself from the bottom of those levers that I use. You just always wanna be careful, right? It's also the reason that I wear the finger cots that I've got on here. Those are sort of a proxy for gloves, but gloves are not very comfortable to wear, uh, you know, for hours. And they're also kind of an interesting thing. When you wear those rubber gloves or the neoprene or the latex gloves, it can actually be difficult to do fine motor work with your fingers because they kind of want to pull your fingers back to straight again. <laughs> and so uh, these finger clots actually do a much better job. And then you also get the benefit of them being a little bit less wasteful, right? You're just, you're not throwing away entire gloves every time you work on a watch. The reason, by the way, that we wear these at all is because there are oils in your fingers. And those oils can stain, and in some weird cases, even potentially corrode the movement. And it makes it look bad, right? A bunch of fingerprints all over the movement. That's not the way we do it. So that's why I wear those. Now we're gonna use, though, one of my favorite tools. I bought this one off of eBay and restored it. That's a cannon pinion removal tool, and it just pops the cannon pinion right off. That's friction fit. You can use a pair of tweezers to do this as well. It's just you risk bending the uh, post that it's on a little bit, which is attached to the center wheel, so you kinda don't wanna be cranking on it. Now let's take it over to the time grapher and let's see how this thing's actually running because as you can see, it's chiming right along. I'm not sure how it's actually doing though. 
Okay, well, it's not doing great. It has pretty low amplitude, way down at around 200 degrees. Uh, the beat error's pretty far out, and it's not keeping good time to boot. So the first thing I'm gonna do when I see a really fast watch like this is demagnetize it. This is a demagnetizer. This is an old vintage one, one that I bought. You can use that for your tools if they get magnetized or movements like this. And we'll put it back on the time grapher. And unfortunately that did not help at all. <laughs> it's still going over 400 seconds a day. So one thing I'm gonna do here is I am gonna try to just regulate this to see how close I can get it before we get in and start working on it. Because sometimes you can make a bit of an improvement by regulating it. And let's see what we came up with. Well, not great. So still a minute off per day, but primarily only 206 degrees of amplitude, and that's just way too low. So let's go ahead and strip this entire watch down, and we will uh, service it and see if we can't get those numbers up. Taking a look here, I am letting down the mainspring. All of the wind that I had put in it is stored up underneath that big circle at the top. And so what I did, as you could see, was unwind it and let all the power out. That way nothing goes flying off on me. Continuing with the disassembly, I can take off the balance wheel, which seemed to be spinning quite freely. I, I have high hopes for this movement. Universal Genève made a very nice watch back in the day. But this thing's old. Like I said, very likely dating this one probably to the late 40s. And that's starting to put it up into the, you know, 70 years old range here. And uh, that can be quite a bit. So it looks like there's a couple of bridges here. And the first one goes on the escape wheel. So I'll just take that one off first. You can see I can use a screwdriver to pry up the bridge. Hmm. That's weird, though. It doesn't actually want to go. I don't... Huh. You know, I have a feeling that that might not actually, it looks separate, but they might have just tricked me. <laughs> so I'm gonna take off what would be the rest of the train wheel bridge because looking at it from the side, oh, it is. That is tricky. You can see that that's actually one big part and that little bridge on the lower right is attached to it. It's not separated. Back in the day for uh, pocket watch movements, which this kind of has a vibe of, that would actually be its own separate bridge. And it looks like they wanted to keep that aesthetic, but they wanted to make it one part so it's more rigid and easier to produce. But they tricked me. I'm just glad I figured it out quickly and didn't start cranking on the thing because that's where you can find yourself in some trouble. Continuing, I can take off the ratchet wheel and the crown wheel now. Those are actually attached above the uh, barrel bridge, as it's called. Most watches, including this one, have two main uh, upper bridges. And we've already taken one off. That's the train wheel bridge. And then the other one is the, the barrel bridge. Those two kind of make up a sandwich with the main plate, which is the bottom piece of bread in this analogy. And then the stuff in between, which is like where the barrel and all the wheels and the springs and stuff, those would be the meat or whatever it is that you like on a sandwich. Okay, so now I can take off the barrel bridge and that'll reveal everything in between. It looks like the, oh yeah, center wheel kind of, ooh, it's stuck in there actually quite good. Okay, it came out. That definitely is a sign that this watch needs a service because the oil that would have kept that lubricated seems to have dried up and made it stick in place, which is, of course, the opposite of what you actually want to happen. And now I can take out the train of wheels, second wheel, third wheel, fourth wheel, and this is the escape wheel coming out. And that only leaves one part left, and as you can see, that's the pallet fork and the bridge that hold, holds it in place as well. This is a very simple movement. One thing that you'll also note that may have been a clue about the age of this movement is the fact that it does not have a center seconds hand. It has a seconds hand down at the six o'clock marker. And again, that's a hallmark of uh, pocket watches and older watches. And it actually took a little bit of technology to get that, that hand in the middle. It was considered a feature. Now it, it's pretty much commonplace, but before it was much more common. Go look at pictures of pocket watches and you'll see very few of them actually have the second hand in the center on the dial. It's, a, it's usually off to the side or down below. 
Okay, so now I can start taking apart the keyless works from this side. And I can flip the movement over to continue. I'll take off this plate that kind of covers up everything. This one has a really interesting setup with the uh, setting lever spring. Take a look at this. I'll take this plate off and look at that spring. Do you see it looks kind of, oh, kind of like boomerang shaped there? I have never seen one quite like that, but I really like it. It's a cool design and it looks like a really well-made kind of beefy spring as well, which I can definitely appreciate. So you can see where it interacts and I just need to get it kind of free, but I gotta be careful. I don't wanna break it. There we go. Look at that spring. They do not design them like that now. Normally, these would be made of a, you know, kind of a wire spring, much cheaper, easier to produce, but that one's pretty cool. All right, flipping the movement back over, and I can continue with the last part. This is the type of watch that when you uh, put the stem in, it's held in place by spring tension rather than being screwed in. And so... I need to take off that spring there so that I can remove the rest of the setting lever here. And there it goes. A little bit stubborn there as well. Again, another sign that it probably could use a service. Okay, now I can put the balance back on the movement for safekeeping as we transition over to uh, getting it to where it can be cleaned. And yeah, that balance looks like it's moving very clean and smooth and that's exactly what we wanna see. And then I can finish tightening it down. Oh yeah, one more thing here. Let's get this barrel disassembled as well. This is where the mainspring is housed. And if you've never seen this before, it's kind of crazy, A, that they can fit such a long mainspring in such a tiny little barrel, but also that this is the only thing that provides power for the entire watch. And that's true of basically any watch you've ever seen that's mechanical watch. Ooh, somebody put a lot of grease in there. Yeah, this little mainspring in here and the energy that's stored up when it's wound is what's responsible to do everything on the watch, including, uh, you know, do the timekeeping part, but also, you know, moving the hands around. And if you've got a calendar, kicking that over. And, you know, if you've got a moon phase, turning that, all of it comes from just a piece of metal. And there's something really poetic about that, right? The people who designed these watches took a piece of metal like this that's kind of a S-shape, kind of a circular piece of metal, and they transferred that into the ability to accurately tell time, date, moon phase, stopwatches, all different types of stuff, all just from a piece of metal. It's really cool. Yeah, that barrel looks like it's got a ton of grease in it. You don't really need that much, actually. It, it can be detrimental as well. So we'll probably need to address that too. In the meantime, we can start putting everything into these little tiny baskets. Now these have mesh on them so that liquid can still enter. And uh, then I can put them in a bigger mesh basket, which will then eventually go into the watch cleaning machine to give this a much needed clean. As you can see, there's quite a bit of gunk and lubricant and stuff on there. So there we go, mainspring in, and everything is ready to go. And now I can put the parts into the watch cleaning machine here. And while I do so, I did wanna mention that I've got a Patreon for this channel. That's a way to support the channel if you like what I'm doing here, or really, you know, if there's any creators that you like out there, a lot of them um, are on Patreon. It's really kind of opened the doors for people to start things that probably wouldn't go in the mainstream, right? Like I wouldn't be able to do a TV show like the one that I do here, right? Like I wouldn't be able to be on network television with what I do, but there's enough people out there that like this type of stuff. And if you're one of them, it's patreon.com slash wristwatch revival. And I did want to say thank you to each and every person who supports me over there. I really do appreciate it. It means the world to me. All right, take a look at the parts all laid out. And uh, yeah, you can see the whole thing here. It's actually a pretty straightforward movement when it's all disassembled. But before we get back to reassembling it, let's address this case situation. Because to me, at least uh, from the listing, this was the biggest issue with this watch, right? A watch like this is very much about aesthetics, right? It's supposed to look nice. And... The way the, that the case is right now with uh, a lot of the gold plating having been worn off is just not acceptable. It's, it's not up to snuff and we're going to have to do something about it. So the first thing I'm going to do is give the case a bit of a cleaning. Now this is a three-part case. There's a case back, a bezel on the front that holds the crystal, and then this mid case here. And uh, that means that with parts 
you know, snugging up against each other like that, you do need to sometimes clean off any type of debris or dirt that may have built up on them over time. And you can see that that's what I'm doing here. So we'll get these roughly cleaned up before putting them in the ultrasonic cleaner just to kind of get them to the state that they're in, right? We want to kind of understand what's going on with it. I can take this crystal out and it has a crack on it. So I'm just going to be replacing that anyway. There's the bezel. And once again, I want to show you what it looks like when that gold wears off and you can see exactly where the plating is gone and where it's not. Now here's the issue. I'm going to replate this thing. That's right. You're coming along for the ride. I've never done gold plating before, but we're going to do it. I mean, we have YouTube videos to guide us, right? What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> now, the issue here, though, is that I want to take off the gold plating that's already on the watch, right? Because I want to get it back down to bare metal and then build that plating back up. And what I'm going to use here is my Dremel tool and a lot of it, <laughs> because basically there isn't a super great way to take off the old plating outside of kind of brute force. And using a hand tools to do it would take a super, super long time. It even took kind of a long time here uh, with the um, Dremel. So then I can throw them in the ultrasonic cleaner to get any remaining compound off and take a look. It actually looks pretty good, right? Because it's polished brass now. All the gold is gone, but brass also has kind of a golden color to it. The problem is that it will discolor again, much like it was before. And also it's not really the right color uh, to be, you know, gold, gold, right? It's a golden hue, but that's not the same thing. So the first thing we're gonna do is do a deep cleaning. Now, of course, we put it through the ultrasonic, but we can electrosonically clean this or electro something, I don't know what it's called, but basically we're gonna put it in a special solution and put some voltage through it and watch what happens. So right there, we're basically using the same technique that we would use to electroplate to clean the surface to get any type of debris, any little bits of gold or other metals, oils from touching it, anything off of there because we need this surface to be polished and fully cleaned before we can start the plating process. Anything that's on there will be captured by the plating process. If you have a big fingerprint on it, you'll see it in the plating. <laughs> and of course you can't get rid of it. So we're gonna rinse this off in distilled water after the parts have been uh, electro cleaned. Now, I know this sounds weird, this solution is for nickel plating. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn down the voltage quite a bit. Now that we're not cleaning and we're doing actual plating, I actually have to get this very low for such small parts. The voltage is proportional to the, the volume, the, the surface area, I should say, of the part that you're plating, and these are relatively small. So I'm gonna turn it down to about one and a half volts, and I am going to nickel plate this. Now, no, I am not gonna change the, the look of this watch. I liked the gold plated look, but here's the thing. Gold actually plates better to nickel than it does to brass. So this is becoming a bit of an involved process. And as you can see, I'm gonna drop this little magnet thing in there and look at my little setup here. I've got this kind of uh, science lab going on the kitchen table and I kind of like it. This is uh, definitely hitting the nerve for me just of kind of the fun geeky stuff that you can do in this hobby. So now, even though you don't see a whole lot of action there, that's because of that spinning magnet at the bottom. It'll keep the bubbles from forming on the surface while it gets plated with nickel. And again, this is just gonna be the intermediary step before we do the gold plating itself. Plating is a very finicky process, but when you get it right, it works out really, really well. What you can see of that cloth in there is actually around a piece of nickel called an anode. And uh, that's where the, uh, the ions kind of fly back and forth. And take a look. You can see it already. It looks pretty good, actually, as nickel plated. I, I think this watch could actually pull off that look, right, of just, you know, that silver color rather than the gold. But I want it to be gold. Like, that's what it was when I bought it, and I think it'll just look really cool. So there it is. Again, I'm rinsing these off in distilled water. And now it turns out Gold plating solution is purple. <laughs> I don't know uh, if they put these colors in to help people differentiate or if it's a natural thing, but uh, it is a kind of a cool deep purple color. And now that I've got the case plated with nickel, it's now prepared to be plated with gold.
You can pick which carat of gold that you'd like to use. It mainly affects the color. This is going to be 18 carat, which is kind of the standard. You can do 24, but it is softer and also a, a different color. It's a much deeper gold color. Uh, most watches are 18 carat. And that's why I went for 18 carat here as well. So same process. Ooh, already kind of looking cool. And we can dip this once again into the distilled water and you can get a quick glance of what it looks like, but take a look at it on the bench. How cool is that? It's gold. Look at that. Not too bad. That's no polishing whatsoever. Also, that's right out of the uh, machine or the, the process, I should say. And look how much cooler it looks. And again, you saw that lug a second ago too. No more wear. And you can't tell where it had worn off and where it was still gold. Begin because I took it back down to the bare metal. So I'm pretty excited about this. Again, my first try gold plating. Um, and I feel like I've got a decent system for it now. So that's something that I can add to my arsenal. And if I come across a watch that needs to be plated in gold or nickel, well, I'm getting better at it. Okay, with that done, now we can turn our attention back to the movement. So we'll get this thing going back. And this, of course, is my mainspring winder. I'm going to get that set. But before I use it, I'm going to take a little bit of grease. This is a specific grease designed for mainsprings. And I'm actually just going to run it gently along the length of the mainspring. That's really all you need. You saw how much grease was in the barrel, but that really can cause problems. So just a little thin layer can help. Uh, keep it so that it doesn't stick together and make sure that it's operating properly. Also give it a little bit of a barrier to any type of corrosion. So now we can put the mainspring into the mainspring winder and then get it seated so that I can wind it in. Though it doesn't really seem to want to go in and I don't know why. I don't, what is going on with this thing? Oh no. <laughs> Okay, well, now I know what's going on with this thing. The middle part of the mainspring has broken off. Now, that could be for numerous reasons. It could be fatigued metal. It also could be user error. Uh, I may have uh, not had it seated properly and then tried to wind it. I'm not actually sure. I didn't force it, and it sort of got loose, and I thought, what the heck just happened? And then, boom, it was broken. So now we have to order a new mainspring, which is kind of annoying, but I get to walk you through the process. And I know some of you who are trying out the hobby wanted to see how it works. So I'll show you here. First off, I'm gonna get this really cool vintage micrometer or fine tasta as it says. And what this does is it allows me to measure the different dimensions of the mainspring. So first up is thickness. So it looks like that's gonna be 0.13 millimeters as it reads out on there. That's a very important measurement. I can also measure the height, get it lined up with the tool. And it looks like 0.42, or I should say 1.42. And so as you can see, I just take notes here on that as I go, because when it comes to ordering it, I'm gonna need all this information. I also need to figure out how long the mainspring is, and I can't, undo it totally because it's got a broken part. So I just kind of eyeball it three, 330, 350 millimeters, somewhere in that range. And then also I need to know how big the barrel inner diameter is. And it looks like it's about 10 and a half millimeters there. And so I'll write that down as well. Now with all of this information, I can now go in search of a mainspring. And there's kind of two ways to go about it. First, I'm gonna put away this really cool antique. <laughs> Do I love this thing? Um, I'm going to go to the website that I use because I just want to show you how I do it. It's Cousins UK. They're based in uh, in England and they are awesome. Really the best website out there. Um, this is not paid or anything like that. I just happen to use them a ton. So as you can see, I can now search by things like mainspring height, right? So I can put in the 1.4 that I measured, the thickness of it. 0.13, you remember when I wrote that down. Now, you don't have to put in each of these things. I put in 10.5 10 .5 for the barrel and I hit search and it came up with one option. So there we go, I can double check that it works. It says non-automatic, that's what I want. This is a, a wine watch, you know, not an automatic. This one is seven pounds 30, you know, which is about 10 bucks American and I can add it to my basket and that's a done deal. Yes, it takes a little while to get here coming from England, but check it out.
it's here. It probably took two weeks in real life, but here for the video, I have it right away. And this is what it comes in. They'll come in a little package like this to keep them clean and separated out from anything else in the mail. And you can just open up the package and then take out the spring. And what you'll see is the spring is actually wound into a thin piece of metal to keep it kind of together. And one side of that metal will have a color of paint on it. In this case, it's that kind of deep red. Sometimes it's blue, sometimes it's black. That's the top. So that's, that lets you know that that goes that way. And then you set it over the, uh, the barrel that you'd like to put it into and you just press it in. And there we go. Once you've got that put in, then boom, you've got your new mainspring. One of the cool benefits of this, by the way, is that as you saw, the mainspring wasn't particularly expensive and it comes like packaged like that. And that means that you don't need mainspring winders. So it is one option if you're looking to get into the hobby, but you don't want to pay the extra for the mainspring winders, which is a very expensive tool. You know, they don't, I mean, they, they cost, you know, pushing a thousand dollars, right? 800 bucks, 700 bucks. I mean, they're expensive. And if you're kind of like, boy, I don't mind buying some screwdrivers and stuff, but I don't really want to take the plunge for that. One option for you is to just buy a new mainspring for every watch you work on. You know, if it costs you 10 bucks, it's not a bad thing to replace the mainspring anyway. And, uh, you know, that's an option that you, that you can use. Speaking of the mainsprings now back in the barrel, I can use this little tool to, uh, to fit it back into place really easy. No big deal. And I can even just put it back into the movement as we begin our reassembly here, trying to see if we can get those numbers up, right? Just wasn't super happy with the numbers, um, before particularly the amplitude was a bit low. The rate wasn't fantastic, but this is quite an old watch and there's a pretty wide acceptable range for something like this. But yeah, that, that amplitude kind of made me think that a watch really did need a service. Start off by putting the train of wheels in after I've put the bridge in. This gives you a nice view of the kind of cascade of wheels as they work their way around the movement over to what we call the escapement. That's the part that goes back and forth. It oscillates. This is called the center wheel, and I'm just gonna put a little bit of medium viscosity oil on it. And as you can see, once I put it into place, it's big, and then the wheels get progressively smaller. They also spin progressively faster. If you know anything about gearing, that last wheel, the escape wheel, the one that's silver, uh, that one spins very, very, very fast, where the first one, the big barrel over there with the mainspring in it, actually spins very, very slowly. Okay, so before I can start putting plates on, though, I have to do kind of an awkward operation here. I need to get the setting lever back in, but if you remember to when we took it apart, it's held in place by a spring. <laughs> so I have to kind of bring it from underneath and then set the spring under it so that it'll hold it in like this. But now I also have to try to screw it down without it jumping away on me. And it just takes a very deft hand and there we go. Now I can put the barrel bridge back on. Again, if we're making the sandwich, we've got the meat in there. Just need some bread for the top here. So we'll get this set into place and just make sure that the wheels are not being pinched or bent and then I can screw down the barrel bridge and the other top of the sandwich here of course is the train wheel bridge and this one's a little bit trickier because it does have three separate pivots that need to all be lined up at once before you can screw it down. And I'll apply a little bit of pressure to it, but oh, it just popped right into place. That's lucky. That doesn't usually happen. It usually takes some, some coaxing, but not this time. I'll take it. And once again, you can see just to make sure that these are spinning freely, right? You, you don't want to see any drag there. In fact, the, the least drag possible, the better, but you do what you got to do. Now, this is going to be the last chance that I'll have access to where the barrel meets that upper bridge, the barrel bridge. And so I'm going to put a little bit of medium viscosity oil in between just because that is a spinning part and it is metal on metal. Now, it's not particularly high friction because it spins so slowly, but you know, you want something there. 
And with that, I can reassemble the rest of the top of the barrel bridge here. So I'll start off by getting the ratchet wheel screwed down. And as you can see, when it comes to the oils on a watch, I have four of them in those little cups over on the side. And if you're wondering why the setup there, the little lids there just allow you to keep them closed virtually at all times. And that means that there's less of a chance of a piece of dust or a fiber or something finding its way into that oil and then finding its way onto your oiler and then into your watch. It's kind of a best practices thing. It's also a nice way to organize the, the oils. Okay, I can put on the ratchet wheel. If you noticed, by the way, it goes the opposite direction that you'd think, kind of an interesting touch. And now I can put on the other side of the watch. So that starts with the cannon pinion. I can just use some firm tweezers to put that into place as you saw, and now I can get onto the keyless works. This is called the clutch wheel, and it takes a little bit of that blue grease. That grease is actually the heaviest viscosity stuff. Watches are kind of funny because when you think about how small the parts are, it would be kind of weird to describe the oils that we use as heavy in any way, <laughs> right? Like if you work in industry or if you've worked on cars or anything like that, you know what heavy grease looks like. This is not that, but relative to the size of the parts and how they interact with each other, that's about as heavy as it gets. Okay, so now we can put the crown and stem in and just give it a quick check to make sure it's all seated properly. And now I can put this really cool spring back in. Still impressed by that design, just really neat. Now I do have to kind of work it over so that it interacts with that sliding clutch. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> One quick shot and it jumped right into place. I guess they knew how to make them. Now I'm gonna use a little bit of grease here on the part of the uh, keyless works where they interact with each other because they are rubbing metal on metal. So it serves two purposes. It makes it a little bit easier to use and also prevents any type of, type of wear over time. If you get a little bit of extra oil on, it's not the end of the world, not best practices, but it's not the end of the world. You use some Rodico to clean it up. You don't want that kind of sitting around in the movement. That's just an intermediary wheel that uh, gets put in between this, which is the minute wheel. There we go. And now there's a cover plate. If you remember taking that off earlier, really simple one here. Later designs for watches incorporated the spring for the setting lever and that cover plate together. They're one piece, but this one predates when they did that as commonly. And so we saw that really cool design on that spring. And then here, just a very basic plate, just kind of holds everything together. Okay, flipping the movement back over, we can now put the pallet fork in. And that means that we're right down the road here um, from getting this thing running again and seeing if we can improve those numbers a bit. By the way, this is the part of the process that is the most exciting, but it's also the time when you really need to take a deep breath. Because if you get too excited or too much in a rush just to see if it's gonna run or how well it does or whatever, this is the point where you can really break something very, very delicate. And um, I mean, what a heartbreaker, right? You do all this work to take it apart, clean it, put it back together, and then you break something at the last second right before it was gonna run. That's when you really wanna make sure you're <laughs> You know, just, okay, calm down, it'll, it'll get there, take your time. Now we can put the balance in, let's get this thing running again. Hey, there we go, just needed a little kickstart to get running. And by the way, I gotta say, this movement's looking nice, isn't it? Got that balance wheel spinning. Yeah, you can see a little bit of wear, it's an old watch, but overall, it's held up really well over the years and it's actually just a beautiful movement to look at too. Okay, so we'll get this balance tacked down and just take a quick second to look at it. You know, you do as much as you need to slow yourself down uh, when, when, when you're gonna do something important, make sure you take a moment to uh, enjoy because it is a really beautiful sight to see one of these things running. Okay, so let's oil up the jewels here 
And as you can see, I use a lot of the same oils. This one is what we call 9010. It's Mobius 9010. That's the company that makes it. It's a synthetic oil that has the least viscosity and it's used for the jewels on the top here of the train, excuse me, of the train wheel, train wheels. So just a little tiny bit. I'm finally starting to really get the correct amount each time. Not every single time, but closer than I used to be. It's just so difficult to get just the right amount because it's so easy to put too much in. I mean, I'll remind you, right? We are looking at a microscope shot. And with that in mind, I am going to finally be able to show you here uh, a part of the process that's very difficult to show on camera. So what I'm trying to do here is use a special lubricant to put it just on the tip of the palette fork, okay? Right there on that facing jewel. Now, the problem, of course, doing this is that the it, you can't get up and down underneath a, a microscope and that's why it's so difficult. But I thought I would at least be able to show you a little bit of how it looks. And that's a really important piece because that lubricant allows the palette fork to slide against the escape wheel cleanly and it can have a big impact on the uh, performance of the watch. Okay, so now continuing, we need to oil the jewels specifically the ones that have capsules on them. And that's a capsule right there. So that goes on the outside of the watch and kind of holds the oil suspended right over the hole for the pivot. And that is used primarily on, uh, you know, jewels that would be receiving a lot of wear or a lot of movement. In this case, this watch has them on the balance jewel. So this one's actually on the bottom. And as you can see, I put a little dot of oil and then very carefully place this plate over and it holds that dot of oil right above the hole. Now, this one <laughs> is actually the easy one of the two. As you might imagine, there's a similar setup on the top of this jewel setup for the balance. And uh, that one is a lot more involved, but it is necessary to do to properly clean one of these and get it functioning to its best ability. So what I have to do is take off the balance wheel, which I've already done here, and then I have to remove the balance itself from the balance bridge, which I'm going to do now. That, that involves two different operations. And then it'll come free. You'll see that here there. So it just falls off and I can just set that aside. And then I need to completely disassemble the balance bridge here as well, which has two screws that hold it in place. And then there's three parts. <laughs> there's the bridge itself. There's a regulating arm. And then there's that capsule that I mentioned. So it's a lot. This is um, a very involved process where if you have a watch that's a little more modern, you don't have to do any of this stuff. You can do it with all of this still on the watch but that's not what we've got here. So there's the three parts that I mentioned, and then this is some solvent that I'm gonna to use to clean off any remaining debris or dirt. We're really going for spotlessly clean here. I mean, we're talking nothing on this jewel. We don't want a speck of dust. We don't want any remaining smudges, stains, nothing, because in order for this watch to perform at its absolute highest, we need that completely cleaned. Now I'm gonna use, Kind of a weird setup here to try to get it all back together. I have to sort of balance everything together. It's very, very tricky to do so. But as you can see, I've got a little bit of a system here where I kind of place one, place the other, and then kind of gently lay the balance bridge on top. The problem here, of course, is that if you jiggle it or move it around, then the oil becomes displaced and then you have to start over again. Now I can put the balance wheel itself back onto the assembly. Very carefully. Tiny little screwdrivers for that. But now I, with that done, I can put it back into the watch. And once again, you get to see the whole <laughs> setup again. Oh, there it goes. It actually just started running on its own this time. So, hey, that's pretty nice. And uh, now that it's running, I can put the screw back on and now I can put it back on the time grapher and see how it does after some regulation and check this out. Big time amplitude there, well over 300 degrees. 320 is about where it settled and we got it down to about eight seconds, eight to 10 seconds a day on average which is so much better and really awesome. I'm super happy with the result. And 
I'm not that surprised. This watch really felt like it was a strong runner. And I think the combination of the full service plus the mainspring was really all it needed to get back to running to really good spec, especially for a watch this old. Okay, let's take a look at this dial before we do the uh, final assembly because I do wanna make sure that there's no big room for improvement on the dial here. So I'm just gonna use some water and some of these swabs to kind of give it a little bit of a cleaning. It looks like it might just be kind of dirty and I can't quite tell. So let's find out. You can see that it has kind of a, almost like a waffle pattern on the outside. That could be a place where dirt or dust could have accumulated over the years. Yeah, and it looks like there's a little bit of room to, uh, to improve here. You have to be super careful with dials like this. These are pad printed dials. It uses a special machine that places any of the ink that you see. So for example, where it says Universal Genève, or if you look it down at the seconds hand, there's those lines around it. Those are just put on there with ink and they often have maybe one layer of kind of lacquer over it, but you have to be very, very careful. And as you can see, I really want to try to get this dirty part on the side, but even after working on it for a while, I realized that it's actually just sort of deteriorated. It's not actually dirt sitting on there. And I'm going to call it a day there. It looks a little bit better, but in order to get it looking amazing, we'd have to completely restore the dial, which I don't have the expertise to do, nor do I actually particularly like, I don't mind a little bit of wear on the dial. And I'll tell you when it gets in the case, with the crystal on your wrist, it doesn't jump out as much as you can see here. So let's put the dial on the watch, speaking of, and now I can just use the little dial screws on the side to secure it to the movement. And with that, I can put the hands back on as well. It's been a really fun little project, you know, get, getting my hands on kind of a, a watch that you wouldn't really see out in the wild, right, day to day, I, I don't know sort of a random universal Genève that's quite old, you know, late 40s, early 50s, just isn't kind of the type of thing you see people wearing. But I'll tell you, watches like this have so much charm, and I think they're really worth bringing back. You know, they just have a different vibe to them than really anything you can buy now. You can see I'm putting on the minute hand now and just being a little bit careful about it. And the second hand is the last one to go on. There we go. And then the last thing that we need to do before casing up the movement back into the uh, case is to put a new crystal on. And thankfully this is a quite an easy process if you have the right tools for it. There's a couple of ways to do it. The way I do it here is using what's, what's called a rover press, which is you can see you turn the top of it to do a press. And that to me gives you a much more controlled approach to this type of thing. You can also use a press that is more like a lever that you push down and then it just creates pressure. That will also work. But I found this to be much better. You know, I took the courses from Mark Lovick, who's you know, kind of my inspiration for a lot of this stuff. He runs the watch repair channel here on YouTube and he has a website called watchfix.com where you can take the classes and he recommended a tool like this. And I see why he was a hundred percent right. If you are looking to get into the hobby, by the way, I do highly recommend taking his classes. They are fantastic. Uh, I learned so much from them. They kind of gave me the jump start that I needed to really kind of commit to it. And as I mentioned before, no, it's not an ad. I don't get anything for it. I just uh, know a lot of you are going, hmm, I wonder if I could do this. And if you're wanting to, to dive in and give it a shot, that's where I would go to kind of feel out where you're at with the hobby because he really does lay it out nicely there. Okay, putting on the hands, or excuse me, the uh, crystal's done, hands are on. Now we can put the winding stem back in and get it seated up. And I can use the blower here real quick just to make sure that there's no dust or debris left on the dial or on the underside before putting it back on it. I mean, already, right? How exciting is that? I, <laughs> it's like once that goes on and the thing really starts to come together, you're like, whoa, this looks great. Because, you know, you and I are working in the trenches, right? We're on the microscope. I've got macro lenses all over these things. We're looking at every little detail. But when you look at these things on your wrist, you don't see all those little tiny things. These, this thing looks fantastic. I'm going to put 
a brand new strap on this watch as well, just to uh, really give it the, the treatment here. And by the way, how about that gold plating? Huh? Looking pretty good. I'm really happy with the way that that came out. That was the hardest thing to learn. A lot of you know, learning and, and reading and really trying to understand it. And here is your end result, a beautiful universal Genève dress watch that is ready for action, a night out on the town, and it's all good to go. Thank you so much for joining me for this journey. I love it that you take the time to hang out with me as I restore these old watches and uh, geek out on my favorite hobby here. You can take a look at the watch there as well. Really appreciate it. And uh, I will remind you that I do have an Instagram for this channel and it's uh, wristwatch underscore revival. If you happen to be over there and you'd like to follow along, make sure you stop over and say hi. Thanks again for hanging out. We'll see you next time.